fell in love with that. I mean, it's out. It's away from people. It's away. We, we're not very social. It's like my mom. She didn't teach me and Melissa to not harm any living thing. We just knew that you don't do it. That in fact, you try to help every living thing. And it's like my mother never said that out loud to us once. Didn't know how bad it was gonna be to fix this thing. Obviously, it's gonna take like a man on the moon project. <laughs> yeah, he's a big guy. You know, uh, two weeks ago, I was walking up here, and it, there was a flock of wild turkeys. And these guys were huge. They were, it was like something Triassic. And they were, they were like, mm, 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 mm. you know, they wouldn't fly. And there was like five of them. And they all just went up into Kemp's Canyon. We call this the turnaround. We're the two natives up here, we say Idrias. Nidria. That's correct pronunciation. Basket, come on, ria, 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 ria. Good. No news is good news. It's amazing how decrepit everything gets in a matter of a year, you know? I mean, it actually used to look like a real ghost town. But the county washed its hands of it, you know, like if we were the ugly, red-headed stepchild. They just declared war. So we were in war with them for 30 years. Fix the fire. Oh, nice and warm. Yes, here we go. In 1981, we moved here. Kept it. He found the he found the property in an ad in the back of the San Jose Mercury News, and it was the cheapest land in California you could possibly get. We had to get out of downtown San Jose. We were dying. I was playing in three different mariachi bands at the time. Kemp wanted. To, he came up here because he had an experiment he wanted to do. It was based on an idea by Isaac Asimov. It was the theory of immortality. I'll get into that later. But the, there's, these are famous sandstone hills. It's called the Franciscan Shelf. It's part of the Diablo Range. And the idea was to bore tunnels and hydroponically grow food and get potassium 40 out of it, which is like, it decays life. Anyhow, one month after we moved in, the Drug Rehab for Futures Foundation moved in. We knew they were going to move up. We found out about it. And none of the ranchers up here wanted them up here. None of them. They said, look, we need a good recommendation because everybody's against us to move this operation up here. And Kim said, well, if I give you a good recommendation, will you allow us to come up in my backhoe so we can rescoop out the settling pond so we can fix the water so that we don't get bad water. They have good water up there. They used a reservoir that's three miles up. They got a pipeline to town. But the pipeline that once came down through here during the old west days was decayed. It was gone. There used to be all kinds of settlements along this line. We happen to be the Gonzales Saloon. I said, no problem, yes, we'll help you, we'll build your pipeline, we'll get good water, you can use the, the reservoir water like us. And the moment they moved in, and the moment they got permission from the supervisors, and the moment Kemp testified in their behalf, they turned around and declared war on us, shot our dogs, ripped up our lines, we had to haul water up here for 30 years. It didn't help things that I fueled it by writing the truth about the place 
for 10 years in the, in the community newspaper. Well, Futures does it again. Futures caught with the pants down. Futures fined $300,000 for running an illegal dump, for storing illegal solvents, running a puppy mill. I seethed and loathed. I really did. We had to bathe in orange water. My mother died of cancer. So Kemp went to the Board of Supervisors meeting and said, look, I'm going to be at their next door neighbors. We don't mind them being here. And so they were allowed to come in. Futures Foundation moved in. Already made housing, which was not so great. I mean, it was shacks built in 1850, you know? So that's what they were occupying. Ex-drug addicts who were trying to get cleaned up. And believe me, this isn't exactly a Passages Malibu. <laughs> they occupied all the old ramshackle shacks and everything up there. There was 80 of them. There was about 80 people living up there. They're called residents. He used them as slave labor for a deconstruction business in San Jose. They would haul up trash up here and dump it on top of the tailing mountains, which, you know, was already a liability. They tore down places and they would store all of the contaminated stuff of deconstruction, they made an illegal dumping site here because they didn't want to pay to take it to the, the places where they should have disposed of it. They used to store all kinds of solvents, illegal paints and solvents and crap that was, wasn't even being made anymore. That was part of their deconstruction business. You know, and so they were, it was like a toxic hellhole. <laughs> That's how the guy made his money, really. And by charging people up the yin-yang for coming to his drug rehab, which didn't cure anybody. Oh man, he got fined a lot of money. They found out about his illegal dumps. Found $300,000. They had to close it down. It became a notorious place. They had so many walkouts. It was so failed. And it finally shut down in 2006. They shut it down after they found a bunch of AK-47s and a heroin wig. That's kind of really illegal to have in a drug rehab place. I mean, there were guys that were court ordered up here. Instead of going to jail, oh, you can go to Futures Foundation and get cleaned up. But finally, when Futures left, we were able to get a line up to the good water right below, but right above the mix point down there to the water that comes out of the reservoir. After 31 years, man, we finally got good water coming out of the line. This whole place was covered in an orange lake coming from Portal 10 which is a hole in the mountain over there. It would come running out. <laughs> Man, all these outbuildings here got burnt down by a, a Yahoo. The town was built in 1856, but by the 1900s, it was booming. And then it boomed two more times because for World War I and World War II, because they, they used mercury to make bombs with. So this was, a happening place. But they originally mined mercury, you know, to separate gold from its ore matrix. It was discovered just in time for the big gold boom. And they used it for tintypes and all, a lot of different things, but that was way before they figured out that mercury was really, really, really poisonous. Boy, it sure looks different than uh, EPA is really. It was like an orange lake it, all around the building. It's an orange lake because the settling pond was just, it was inoperable. It, you know, it hadn't been dug out or anything for years and years and years. Now, you know, I guess they put a culvert in someplace. They're diverting it. This part looks a lot better. <laughs> but I used to show, I used to take people up here and show them the orange river coming out of the, the mountain and they couldn't believe it you know it was like it was something out of the twilight zone oh hello kid i haven't been up here since the epa redid this 
I had no idea they had made such such progress. <laughs> Woo! Man, I used to, um, you know, I give these lectures to Gavilon students that come up, and I used to walk them up here, and they'd go, oh, God! They'd say, <laughs> they thought it was like the X-Files, man, you know? And there would be, we'd have to, like, kind of gingerly go through the orange muck. And I wanted to show them where it was coming out of the hole in the side of the mountain. And you know, on top of this orange lake, there is this iridescent sheen. It looked like it was like an oil spill. One time when I was showing the students that, there was uh, some field geologists up here. And in fact, they were with the EPA, you know. I guess, I figured they were doing a study of a study of a study. And, uh, you know, but I welcome them. At least, you know, somebody's looking at it. And they explained to me, this is a whole different organism. That colored iridescent sheen, that is a whole, that is an animal that is, was actually lives off of methylmercury. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, I'm, going, I'm looking at an animal. <laughs> oh my God, this is a wild, woolly world. You know, who would have thunk that methylmercury, which is, you know, methylmercury is, it's a species of mercury. It's an organic species of mercury. You know, that's the worst kind, it's the kind that bioaccumulates in any living thing. That's the kind that bioaccumulates in fish. We're spreading the wealth up here. These people in San Francisco, they want to go whining and dining and have their halibut drenched in butter and wine. Well, they're getting mercury <laughs> from New Idria in that fish. When we moved here in 81, we knew the water was polluted going by our house. We had plans to dig a well, and we also knew that there was a reservoir up there with a piping system that came down to this town. It's about three miles up, but it, it also went down past our property. But at that point in 1981, the whole piping system of the good water piping system was totally decrepit, broken up, it didn't work. So our plan was to like redo the settling pond with our own equipment, our own bulldozer, and set up a pipeline to the good water that comes down from the reservoir to connect up to it. And well, it turned out we couldn't dig a well because all the aquifers are tarnished with orange water too, you know. So we really did need to put up a piping system. So um, I, my mom, tried to get, uh, you know, every water agency, state, local, federal, to do something about it. And they just kept passing the buck. That, oh, it's too big a problem. New Idria was the biggest mercury site in the, in the world, you know. And, you know, we can't do anything about it. Well, there's nothing we can do. And, you know, all we wanted them to do was to keep the bad water from mixing with the good water. So we would have good creek water. We'd, you know, get our water that way. But they wouldn't. So we just started a, our own war and kept a file. And finally, uh, we got the EPA's attention with the help of the old Board of Supervisors in San Benito County. because. Uh, we made up a binder. We got the EPA to do a report, finally in 97. And you know, basically all it said was, yeah, this water's really polluted. <laughs> you know? Yeah, okay, you know, clean it up. You know, because actually it was the federal government, which was the biggest buyer of mercury, of course, for their bonds. So they're the, you know, we considered it their problem. They're the ones who made the mess, they should clean it up. My family, we gave up trying to get that creek cleaned up years ago. When the paper got bought out again and I was off the paper, I just, you know, to hell with it. Just to hell with it. You know, we'll never see it cleaned up. We used to have to haul our water in from town or from neighboring ranches, five gallon containers. I almost broke my arms. Every day, I'd have to go and get water. 
and that and you know we would have to bathe in the orange tainted water and uh, and believe me we've all lost a lot of teeth that stuff is very lethal my mom died of liver cancer my sister has sinus cancer you know my brother has heart problems god knows what's wrong with me so you know and we've had many dogs die from it you know they'd be waiting in the creek we you know we'd give them good water but so you know we'd have to be really careful about our water that we hauled up you know it was used only for cooking and uh yeah, just for cooking, basically. But we'd wash our clothes in bad water. And we had a really elaborate filtration system that my brother devised over the years that contained, it was made up of five settling tanks. And uh, two of them were ocean buoys that we somehow got. <laughs> we still have it as a backup, just in case. We knew the property was polluted. We didn't know how bad. Didn't know how bad it was gonna be to fix this thing. Obviously, it's gonna take like a man on the moon project. That we fell in love with it. I mean, it's out, it's away from people. It's away. We, we're not very social. This is the rec room. This here is the same model of trailer that was used in the movie The Long Long Trailer with Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, the notorious model that is so awkward and cumbersome. Can you imagine getting this, this thing up <laughs> through the wiggle tail? I mean, they were scraping the cliffs, but they did it. They managed to do it. it you know, we got this thing for almost everything around that's built here is pretty much found materials. It took 30 years to do this, but so we made the addition to the trailer. We lived in it for a while, and then we made our own cabins. Kemp built everything. Kemp is a, a great engineer. He's a natural genius, a mathematician. He built this gazebo. It's more solid than a neutron star. We call that the plank. Block the plank. Oh yeah, it's very dangerous. Yeah, that was built by a drunk, obviously. He's gone now. This is the rec room trailer. And this is where we lived for many years before we built our, our makeshift cabins. This was my bedroom for... This space right here was my bedroom for many years. Way up in the mountain, there's like a, it's the only place in the world where a gemstone called benitoite comes from. Benitoite is um, a really beautiful cobalt blue gemstone that is kind of soft, but it's still a gemstone. And it's the rarest in the world because it, this is the only place in the world that you can collect it in any traceable amounts. And it's pretty extinct by now. I mean, it's been mined out, but it, it's only like a four acre plot. And it's called the gem mine. It's the Benitoite gem mine. Well, we have a placer claim about a mile downstream from the main locale. As we wait for Benitoite to come down the creek into our claim. Otherwise, we'd be high grading on the main gem locale. We, for, for many years, would um, plaster mine from the San Benito River our Benitoite from there. And we'd get a, a little bit, it wasn't that much, it didn't make us rich, that's for sure. And you know, we had a little business, but it's pretty much gone now. That's why we have a dirt biker park now. You know, Kemp still sells Benitoite, but there's also like Melanite, which is like a black, um, it's like a black gemstone, and then there's, it's opaque though. And then there's Dementoid, which is a green gemstone. 
and red garnet, but there's very little red garnet. There's not much of that. And then there's zinc. They had one of the biggest asbestos mines, KCAC, up there. It's, it's massive. And it's this huge pit in the ground that's like, a, I don't know, it's like 10 football fields or something. It's just huge with different levels. The only thing, way they use asbestos now is we export it to different countries that haven't made it illegal yet, and it should be illegal all over the world. My father is an aerodynamicist. That means he, he worked at all the different NASA centers. NASA Lindley, NASA Johnson, NASA Ames. So we weren't army brats, we were NASA brats because he's he was a rocket scientist. <laughs> so so we had to move a lot. And we actually lived in Alabama, Decatur, Alabama, when he was moved to NASA Langley with Werner von Braun right after Operation Paperclip. Operation Paperclip is when Americans went into Germany and swooped up all of their brilliant rocket scientists, including Werner von Braun, to get them before the Soviets could, quite literally, and, and so that we would have get them on our side and we put them to work and we gave them clemency, obviously. Even though they were working to like exterminate people and they didn't want to. All they wanted to do like Werner von Braun they just wanted to like, make rockets that would get us to the moon, at least. And he certainly did with Saturn V and my father. So we moved around a lot. But we were not army brats, we were NASA brats. Eventually uh, landed back in California where we started. on a farm in Missouri. His parents died when he was 10. And that's the same year, the same year he got um, polio. And they had to, it was during the Dust Bowl, you know, they had to, in the, in the Depression. It, man, they were really hardy people and they figured it out. They luckily were not sent to an orphanage. My uncle Kemp, was 13. My father, Phineas Skinner Woods, and my uh, aunt, Dorothy, they survived. I like to feed people. I guess I took it up from my mom. Well, my mother was a great cook, the Sicilian. She cooked. I think she's cooking right now for many people in the that life. My mom's, when I cook, and something actually comes out like so better than I would normally be able to make it, I know that it was her, not me. Just not, not do this and that and that. I know it was her. Yesterday I was cooking, I just stopped. I said, I love you so much, Mom, because I knew she was there doing it. Man, she's in a lot of places at a lot of times. Yeah, you know, I don't know where that came from, except that my mother was, I guess if you had to classify her, she was probably like a Hindu Jainist, and they don't believe in killing anything. Not even mosquitoes, not an ant, nothing. And I'm the same way. I mean, hell, I could be reincarnated. That could be my cousin, you know? I just, I will not kill anything. I will not do it. Because I'm bigger than something doesn't give me any right to kill anything. And yes, I'm a hypocrite when it comes to meat. But I try to buy only non-tortured meat. I try to eat animals that are raised cruelty-free. Pinochi is a, is a big mecca for that. They grow cruelty-free, you know, eggs and meat and milk. 
so it's it's you know it's people are starting to wake up to you know understanding that they're not the rulers of the world sorry yeah I mean I just animals they don't lie to you they don't deceive you I've seen a cat try to do it a few times but you know I mean they, they do nothing but love you and we're responsible for them we're responsible for you know taking them out of the wild and domesticating them and their children were responsible for taking care of them. Ha ha! Hey, orange, 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 where did he, where'd he go? Ah, he's a mighty soul. He's a mighty soul. You know, he still goes after. He still hunts. Ah, Mr. Mr. Evil. I love him so. He's like my Svengali. Ah, the little cur. 23 years old. Well, 23 and three quarters, anyhow. We'll hit 24. We'll hit 24 together. One. I was still playing in the mariachi as a violinist, and we were not a singer. <laughs> I was also working for a daily newsletter called the Space Back Daily about space entrepreneurialism. I started out as a stringer, submitting stories to the Pinnacle newspaper, which is located in Hollister, and they really didn't have very good writers. So they appreciated my writing. I don't have a degree in writing. I have a specialty in creative writing from San Jose State, but it's liberal arts with a specialization in creative writing. So that's how I started writing for the Pinnacle in 98. Then the paper got bought by Tracy Cohn and Anna Dos Remedios, and they kept me on, and I became their lead writer. And part of my beat, you know, we all had beats, was basically I had everything. I had to do politics, all county business, the environment, and that means like the whole county. I didn't have to cover stuff in the city of Hollister itself, which is the county seat. So I had to do everything else. So I had to write about the fact that this was the biggest source of environmental contamination in California. And I knew more about it, and yeah, I happened to live a mile away from ground zero, but we always put that as a tagline at the end of my stories to let people know, yeah, you know, I might be a little bit jaded about it. And then Tracy decided to give me a column so that I would keep, <laughs> keep my stories more well-grounded. <laughs> so I bitch about the, uh, the contamination up here. The main theme was the Orange Creek. And it was a political satire column. I've always been politically active. My mother saw to that. I mean, we were active when we were five years old. She was head of the Democratic Party in Santa Clara County and a delegate. And um, we were always very liberal. Socialist, you might, you might say. So my mom was the one who really started fighting the fight to get this place cleaned up. And then through the stories in the newspaper, you know, I thank Tracy Cohn for allowing me to, to, to beat the drum. I mean, I must have written got a, a hundred different stories about what was going on and what was being done about cleaning this place up and every every little single action if it came in front of the EPA they were doing an yet another study 
we would do a story about it. Then they sold the paper and the new owners who were developers didn't like me. They forced me out and they blackballed me so I couldn't get a job at any paper. That's when I decided to write the book. The book's not selling very well. Only my best friends bought it. So the book was born out of having to do that column once a week. You know, it's in vignettes. My mother wanted me to write that book. She wanted me to put all my columns together and write a book. Well, what I did is I, I took about five of the columns and I wrote a book around it, really, basically. Because I didn't run really just redo the columns. What's very ironic is that that whole book, what that book, that I wrote, Quicksilver Chronicles. What it's about, it's a satire, really, about the 10 year struggle of my family having to live with mercury orange tainted water because of this drug rehab that lived here. And because of the inertia of the state and the feds and, and every government agency that just doesn't give a damn the fact is, is that this water poisons the San Francisco Bay. And I had been screaming that for years and years, but you know, who am I? I, you know. But it turns out I was right. And it, the irony is, is the moment I finished writing that book, the moment, the month I finished writing it, it was August 2011, the EPA came up the road in 18 wheelers with all this equipment to start cleaning up the creek. So I had to come out with a second edition with an editor's note at the end saying, by the way, they're finally cleaning it up. And they didn't start cleaning it up because I wrote my book. Believe me, none of them have read that book. It was just, just a strange coincidence that it would happen then, you know. I ran, I ran for assembly, and look at, like you can't even read it, you have to be tailgating someone to see it, of course. <laughs> oh, oh, the humanity. Uh, <laughs> remember freedom? What does that mean? That, you know, that doesn't mean anything. Woods for assembly does. <laughs> hey, I did get 5% of the vote. That's not bad for a third party, you know. Most libertarian and third party candidates usually only pick up 2%, but you know, I hate the libertarians too. I mean, because it just doesn't work. It's like, like yeah, I'm all, you know, personal responsibility, but come on, man. We're overpopulated on the earth. So the only way it's gonna get done is to kind of like pick up the pieces together. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, that's for the next 30 seconds. I was asked to do some art. Tracy Cohn asked me to do some portraits of her dog. So that's how I started doing art. I really didn't think I could. I didn't see why anybody would want them. People ask me to start doing pictures of their animals. I only do animals. Don't do humans. It's like I said, all my humans look like sitting bull.
I used to feel trapped here. You know, um, when I was a youngin, when I was kicked in the teeth by another man, which will never happen again. Never, ever. But you know, women, when they're young, or when they're growing up, and when they're in their 20s, 30s, even their 40s, they, they think that they're no good unless a man loves them. I was one of them. And uh, it happened for the last time to me in 1996. And I came back home here from San Jose and I knew I was pretty depressed, but I knew that this is, this is it. This is, this is where I will live and die and I will do it by myself. And our family did on this land. As vertical and toxic as it is, you know, um, and that just was the end of the line. And I, it took me a couple of months, but I accepted it. And I would, and, and man, I gotta tell you something about New Atria. It gets under your skin. You can't get rid of, I mean, it just, it gets ya. And, and, Every 10 days or so, when I had to do a supply run to town, and I come back home, and it's such a relief, it's such a relief to be back, to be back. And I just love my home. I'm fiercely, fiercely protective of it. This is what happened. I fell asleep on Panucci Road while I was driving it. When I fell asleep, my foot stepped on the accelerator and I was going 70 miles an hour on a right angled curve in Panucci Valley and I have the recollection of my mother pulling me out. My mother's dead. She's been dead since 2006. She pulled me out. I was in a coma for 28 days. In the coma, um, all that time, I know it sounds weird, but I was on, I was on a garbage barge going up a canal in France. I don't know if it was La Seine or not, but I do remember very vividly and smelling it and seeing it, the colors of the flowers on the banks. It was very vivid, vivid, vivid. Very vivid. And uh, I didn't realize that something rotten had happened uh, until, because my sister was on the garbage barge with me. My sister was still alive. I didn't realize until she said, Kate, don't you know what happened? In the coma, in the vision, she said, look, look here. And at the edge of the barge, there were all these smashed cars right next to each other. And one of them was my purple Miata. It was, you know, 1980 Miata. It was an ancient piece of crap. But it was Jonestown grape. And it was smashed like this, you know, and it's like, and she said, see, look, look, look at your car. And I said, huh? I guess it's gone. I guess, I guess, oh, I got in a wreck. And uh, it was a few days after that, apparently, that I woke up. And the nurses, of course, called me the monster. They said I kept trying to get up and move and walk because I was living in that, that vision. I was with my mother, my mother was there, we were bearing a doll at Disney World in France. <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> Disney World, France? I mean, and then I finally woke up. That wasn't, you can't say it was a dream. Because it was pretty, it was pretty awful. I had nurses after my ass. 
and I was bearing a doll on Disneyland in France, the latest Disneyland they have in France. I was going up a garbage barge. Now, let me tell you something. I don't like France. I don't like. I don't want to be there. The people there don't like Americans. I don't want. I have no desire to go there. The, the only place I want to go is Spain and Italy and Canada. And, you know, I've been to Mexico a million times. I just... Why France? Why would that happen to me in this coma?